Uh, I'm Mark Miller, and I'm going to speak to you today about uh, our approach to ownership in support of the goal of offer safe trade of mutable objects. The uh, talk itself is split into three parts. Uh, in the first part, we're go I'm going to explain uh, our approach to ownership, which we call e-rights. Uh, the key attribute that we achieve there that distinguishes it from other ownership systems is credibly transferable ownership. Then in the second part, I'll be speaking about ZOE, which is our smart contracting framework that provides a important safety property we call offer safety. And then in the third part, I'll be speaking about um, the uh, new result, which is still in progress engineering-wise, which is ownables, which is where we extend this framework to deal with the special problems that have to do with trade of mutable objects. So we can divide uh, property rights ownership in support of trade into three primary attributes. Uh, if you uh, just in th thinking in terms of the pre-computer science normal property rights literature, uh, if you own something, you can exercise your right of ownership. You can use an object that you've got. So translated into the terms of objects, it means you can invoke the behavior of the object, provoke whatever behavior uh, happens as a result of invoking the object. Uh, exclusive, right, exclusive transfer of the rights of ownership, meaning that if you own an object, not only can you use it, but you can transfer to someone else the exclusive rights of ownership. Uh, and that's a recursive definition so that once you've transferred to them the rights of ownership, you no longer have either the right of exercise or the right of ownership, and that they in turn have both so they can further transfer the right of ownership. And then assay, uh, which, uh, which is just a fancy term for measure, like assaying a bar of gold to know uh, credibly that it is gold and how much gold it is. So being able to credibly measure an asset that will be traded is necessary in order to bring about credible trade. So the object capability approach only gives us itself one of these three properties directly. Uh, by having a capability to an object, you can invoke the object and provoke whatever behavior it is. And in fact, you can think of an object capability exactly as the permission to provoke the behavior of the object it designates. By RCAP here, I'm, uh, I mean reference capabilities, but I actually mean, um, uh, I mean that in the broad sense. Both the language constructs referred to specifically as reference capabilities, but also ownership types, also linear types, affine types, all of these static type system, reasoning systems for transferring exclusive ownership. And those actually meet both of these criteria with the full recursion there. When you transfer um, uh, with reference capability, you lose both exercise and ownership, and the receiver now has both exercise and ownership and can further transfer. However, reference capabilities um, do not, within the framework, the, within the distributed system framework constraints that I'll be explaining, reference capabilities do not provide for credible assay. The e-rights framework, which we've been developing for a long time, uh, provides for the exclusive transfer of ownership and for the credible assay, but it does not provide for exercise. It's only the transfer of symbolic rights. And what we need is to support all three properties together in order to get offer safe trade of mutable objects. So we're doing all of this with a smart contract system running, on, running 
on top of an object capability system running on blockchains and other things. Um, so before we get into smart contracts in that new abstract world, let's examine in some depth a smart contract that we're all familiar with. A vending machine is a mechanistic embodiment of an exchange contract. My money for the seller's snack. Now the notion of exchange, money for a snack, is a symmetric notion. Even though it's symmetric, for some reason, I've never seen a vending machine that first gives me the snack and then demands my money. <laughs> and the reason is that the, the vending machine's enforcement abilities does not extend beyond the box. If it gave me the snack first and then I ran away without giving it the money, it could not run after me demanding the money. So instead, the vending machine implements an escrow exchange contract. Uh, the snacks are already visibly escrowed from the seller, displayed to the, bu to the prospective buyer so they can see what the choices are that are already in escrow. When the buyer puts in the money, the vending machine is now, now has in escrow everything it needs to enforce the terms of the contract. Once both the snack and the money are escrowed, it can now make the snack available to me, make my money available to the seller. It's even a good example of this principle offer safety, which is Offer safety is that each of the, the parties to the exchange either gets what they said they want or gets a full refund of everything that they had placed into escrow. So a well-functioning vending machine, if it fails to give me the snack I asked for, I can hit the refund button and I get back everything that I had escrowed on the way. However, uh, the, it, does not, it does not fulfill the recursive aspect or owner, of ownership or the trade in the face of mutability. Uh, it's a one-time sale. Once I buy the drink and I start drinking it, the remainder of the drink is no longer an asset that I can sell. So at that point, the remainder of the drink has value to me, but it is not transferable value. The value of the drink as it's in escrow in the vending machine is not just something that's prospectively of value to me, it's transferable value. So an, a positive example with regard to that issue is selling a house. The house goes through two phases, typically. In one phase, you're living in the house. When you're living in the house, you've got all your stuff scattered around in a way that, that has a lot of context to it that's only meaningful to you. So the value to you of living in the house with all of your stuff around uh, adapted to your lifestyle, there's a tremendous amount of value that is non-transferable value. But then when you go to sell the house, you um, a typical pattern is you then vacate the house, you remove all of the stuff that has the non-transferable value, leaving behind the house that is the, the, remain, the remaining value of the house is the house that has the transferable value, the house for a buyer to then acquire in order to gain that transferable value. The other thing that's really important about vacating the house is you stop mutating the house. And you do that before the house gets inspected. And the reason you do that is so that the result of the inspection is meaningful and credible to the, respect, to the prospective buyer. If, if while you're living in the house, you might damage it, lowering its value, you might build an extension to it, raising the value. Um, but, in any, but in either case, the result, if you were still in the house, the result of the inspection would no longer be a credible signal to the buyer of what they would actually be getting. So the vacating serves both of those, both of those purposes. And 
Um, so the, the house goes through this two-phase cycle. Once somebody buys the house, they can then live in it with all the scattered non-transferable value and then sell it again. So it has the, the nice recursive aspect of, of propagating ownership. So we apply this two-phase cycle to go back and forth between OCAPs, which is our approach to exercise, and E-rights, which is our approach to um, exclusive rights transfer and assay. Um, but it's wor we're skipping the RCAPs column, the, and since that's sort of the, the, uh, a central concern of IWACO, it's worth explaining why it is we chose not to start from the reference capability approach. And to understand that, you need to understand our, our overall distributed systems framework. We've got, we're in a distributed system with many, many machines. Uh, each of the purple rectangles here is a physical machine. Each tower is a logical machine. So a blockchain is a virtual machine that is built out of massive multi-way agreement between many physical machines that redundantly uh, engage in exactly the same computation and then cross-check each other in order to build a virtual machine that's much more trustworthy than any physical piece of hardware can be. But we're in an overall system that has multiple blockchains, mutually suspicious, talking to each other, as well as, as non-blockchains. Um, you know, private permission replicated systems as well as non-replicated systems. On top of this, we run our world of VATs. A VAT is a process-like unit in, our, in the communicating event loops concurrency model where each VAT is a separate unit of concurrency with one internal thread of control running an event loop. And these VATs talk to each other uh, uh, very much in the same way, whether they're on the same machine or whether they're across different machines on the network. On top of that, we build our distributed object capability system where objects within the same VAT talk to each other with the security properties enforced using programming language technology. And then when an object talks to an object on another VAT on another machine, the object capability security properties are enforced cryptographically by the cryptographic protocol. So the overall result is that we have mutually suspicious objects on mutually suspicious machines talking to each other. And the mutual suspicion at both levels is important. On top of that, we build our system of, of e-rights and smart contracting. And that's where we're actually going to spend most of the talk but before we get there, the important property with regard to the distributed systems constraints is exactly this mutual suspicion. We've got mutual suspicion among the machines, and we have mutual suspicion among the objects. Reasoning about mutual suspicion at all these different levels would seem to be very complicated. We need a simplified theory that nevertheless captures for us everything we need to worry about as we're doing secure programming. So there's this property that, we, that object capabilities made into a distributed protocol have that we make much use of, which is a, a misbehaving machine cannot do damage to other participants on the network that is, that is in excess of the damage that can be done by a misbehaving group of objects running on a correct platform. So the ob where the objects are themselves constrained by the object capability rules but are, are, are doing things that you might consider to be misbehavior. Uh, so a way to think, so the, the the phrase we like to use is you can reason about all suspicion as if you are suspicious only of objects. And the way objects capabilities achieve this is actually very straightforward, which is the cryptographic protocol, well, an ob a, a, 
effects are performed outside the system by utilizing a capability to an object elsewhere. And the cryptographic protocol ensures that even a misbehaving machine cannot use a capability unless it has been given to some object on that machine. If the machine as a whole has never gotten the capability, then the capability, then the machine cannot use it. And that's equivalent to all of the objects on that machine being together in a vast conspiracy such that any capability that's given to any of them are then used by the conspiracy of objects to do damage elsewhere. Um, so to put it another way, ignorance about whether the platform misbehaves can, without loss of generality, be transformed, be, be represented as ignorance of the configuration of objects running on the machine. And therefore, you can reason at a uniform level where in the, the same worries that you would have interacting with the local object that you're suspicious of, you can use to interact with the remote object that you're suspicious of running on a platform you're, you're suspicious of. So our constraints are mutually suspicious peers, blockchains, other machines. The VAT-to-VAT uh, -to -VAT communication um, uh, it basically just needs to be a secure, secure bidirectional data pipe. So TLS among normal machines, the IBC is the inter-blockchain protocol that is a protocol to do TLS-like bidirectional data types, data pipes between blockchains. In both cases, what we build on top of that is OCAPN, our cryptographic distributed remote invocation object capability protocol. And having done that, OCAPS, beco uh, which is, um, OCAPS becomes a good local theory of, of the possibility of remote misbehavior. And the reason that they're a good theory is that they are weak enough to correspond to what can be enforced cryptographically. By contrast, RCAPS is too strong a theory. It's a theory that, that gives us very valuable security properties that can be enforced locally, but this exclusive rights transfer that is sort of guaranteed statically by the RCAP type system does not represent a good theory of what you can count on remotely. For a cryptographic protocol to enforce that on a counterparty remotely, it would have to cryptographically enforce that the counterparty cannot double spend. All of the blockchain, the best we know for solving the double spending problem is blockchains and the, the blockchain approach to double spending is just to provide very good evidence that the blockchain does not engage in double spending, but it is not something where I, interacting with the blockchain, am engaged in a protocol that prevents it from double spending. So I have to still suspect, I still have to worry about whether or not it is engaged in double spending. So it's still, there's still a trust issue, a judgment issue. So, in the e-rights approach, the issuer, which, will be, which I'll be explaining, is the reification of the suspicion of remote behavior. Uh, so that you can um, uh, say that the, the, the trust that you're placing in a foreign issuer reflects your suspicion uh, judgment about whether or not that issuer is double spending the currency that it issues. Yes? This is a really interesting point, uh, so I, I, I really appreciate you making it. Um, I am curious about the argument that uh, our caps are too strong, um, which I agree is true looking purely locally, uh, but could I not build a virtual machine on the blockchain that provides the guarantee to the same degree as the blockchain, right? Which probably most people find sufficient. Uh, so and give the programmer the view from an RCAPS perspective. Okay. So 
if you were willing to simply fully trust any other arbitrary blockchain out there that, that is doing what you say, uh, such that you're, or to put, to put the trust in, a, in, in more explicit terms, if you're willing to be fully vulnerable to your assumption being violated, then the answer is yes. Um, uh, I, the premise already in the multi-blockchain ecosystem uh, held together with protocols like IBC is already that the blockchains are mutually suspicious, that, with, that the code that's running on a blockchain and the immediate clients of that blockchain uh, generally implicitly trust the, the immediate blockchain they're interacting with, but the blockchain's communicating with other blo you know, the code on that blockchain in turn communicates with the code running on other blockchains with assets that are issued by issuers on other blockchains, and generally those connections are one where you're very careful about making explicit the trust assumptions so that if another blockchain misbehaves, double spends or, or inflates its currency in a way that it promised not to or whatever, that, it's, that, that the immediate blockchain is not itself subject to, you know, uh, does not itself misbehave because of the implied misbehavior of something else. Oh, and I should say also, the fact that it's too strong to be a local theory of remote misbehavior is not an argument against doing RCAPs or stronger type systems locally. I mean, there's also the case with many other static type systems. It's too strong to represent guarantees about remote misbehavior. Nevertheless, they can be useful to program with locally, but you just have to remain unconfused about what they are and are not guaranteeing in the context of an overall distributed system. So uh, this code brings about um, the e rights level of abstraction for the example of money. Money is a great simple and and you know clearly sort of the, the first example of interest of an asset that needs to have the e-rights properties. That it's, uh, that ownership can be transferred, that in the transfer it can be assayed so the receiver can credibly know what they would be getting, uh, and money is not exercisable. The only thing you can do with it is transfer and keep records. There's no mutable, op there, there's, you know, you can't eat a dollar bill. There's no mutable object there that you can make use of. So um, this, uh, this code is a realistic piece of code um, that really brings about the e-rights level abstraction built purely out of the object capability level of abstraction. It's worth stepping through how this code works. So on the outside here, oh, Oh, uh, okay, there we go. On the outside here, we have our make mint function. And each time make mint is called, it creates three objects, the, uh, the ledger, the issuer, and the mint. So let's call it, so now we've got these three objects, ledger, issuer, and mint, that together represent a money system, represent a money system that instantiates a logical currency. So let's invoke make mint a few, more, a few more times. Each of these planes is a separate logical currency, a separate currency system, each isolated from the other. Um, now, with this um, currency on top, which we'll call bucks, the, we can invoke the mint object in order to create a purse and we're going to do that to create a purse with 100, 100 bucks in it that we're going to give to Alice to set up the initial conditions. We're going to do it again to create a purse with 200 bucks in it that we give to Bob. So every time we call purse, it creates a purse object and then registers the purse in the ledger with the associated value being the initial balance. Okay, so having set up the initial conditions, we're now going to examine a scenario in which Alice wants to um, uh, buy from Bob a concert ticket. So 
what Al Alice starts this by sending to her main purse a withdraw message. And, oh, I'm sorry. I ah, got ahead of myself. Hold on. Okay, by sending the withdrawal message, and the withdrawal message creates a new payment purse and changes the ledger to move the requested amount of assets from being associated with the main purse to being associated with the payment purse. And then the payment purse is returned to Alice. Alice can then use it to send a buy message to Bob And at this point, we have an interesting dilemma. As far as Alice is concerned, she has paid Bob. She sent Bob the payment object. But as far as Bob concerned, he's not really been paid yet. Uh, all he's gotten is some object from someone that had the ability to send him an object. Uh, he doesn't know that it's actually a purse. If, it is a, if he do, knew it was a purse, he doesn't know it's a purse of the same currency. If he knew it was a purse of the same currency, he doesn't know that it has ad adequate funds in it. And most of all, he doesn't know that Alice has dropped her reference. So even if he knew it was a purse of the same currency with adequate funds now, he doesn't know it will still have adequate funds by the time he deposits it. So, um, so, so right now, Bob only has the assurances at the OCAP level of abstraction. He's got an object he can invoke, he can exercise it. But it might be shared with Alice, it, and it's completely opaque to him. He doesn't know what he's gotten. What he needs is something at the e rights level of abstraction. He needs the rights that, that Alice tried to convey by sending him the payment. Uh, and he needs those rights exclusively. He needs to know that Alice no longer has those rights, uh, and he needs to know what rights it is that he's gotten. So he achieves all of this. By sending the deposit message to his main purse with the payment purse as argument, if the deposit message succeeds, then Bob knows that the rights have been transferred. Notice that the zero, the, the payment purse went from 10 to zero. Bob, uh, Bob's main purse went from 200 to 210. What he knows is that he has now gotten exclusive access to the rights that were conveyed. Notice he did not get exclusive access to any object. The rights themselves are not an object. They cannot reify them at the level of, um, of the theory of objects. Um, uh, Alice might still have a hold of the payment purse, it's just the payment purse is now useless to her because the rights it represents have been moved. And um, uh, the deposit method also verifies uh, in, in doing so that it is a payment purse of the same currency and had adequate funds having moved them. So before leaving the slide, I just want to call your attention to the issuer, which will become important later on. The issuer itself, which is, is, whose identity is used symbolically to stand for this currency as a whole. You know, bucks versus yen versus some other currency, each of which are identified uniquely by a distinct issuer identity. The issuer itself only has a make empty purse method message that creates a new empty purse, thereby does not convey any of the e rights um, by doing it, it just creates an empty vessel. Um, and then the purse itself has a get issuer method that reveals the issuer that the purse is a purse of. Uh, I also want to avoid painting too rosy a picture. Uh, this code, while correct and, and uh, would actually do what everything I claim when run on the foundations that we've built, uh, 
this is simpler. By the time we've, we make this all work in production within the constraints of all of the other engineering goals that we have, it's sub substantially more a piece of code. So I don't want to misrepresent that. Um, but it's not a hugely you know, larger piece of code. It's, it's still readable, inspectable code that you can examine and gain confidence in. But even for this much more extensive piece of code, a point I want to make is that this piece of code brings about this decentralized, distributed, cryptographic money protocol among all of these participants. And the code itself never mentions any cryptographic concept. That the, we invest all of the work in building a cryptographic protocol in getting the object capability layer, um, you know, having it achieve its security properties. And then having done that, we can now uh, express all of these properties purely in terms of objects and build the e-rights layer of abstraction in turn on top of that, continuing to avoid the need to explicitly talk about cryptography. Okay, so, so having built the object, the e-rights level of abstraction on top of objects, now let's shift our visual language to directly reify the concepts at the e-rights layer where the rights that are being transferred are themselves have a visual representation. So we can see that in terms of purses, where the right moves between purses, or sometimes more abstractly, we'll just use the notation of the right moving between Alice and Bob, with the purses themselves being implicit. So uh, that's our, that's, that concludes the first part of the talk with talking about the relationship between these two levels of abstraction, emphasizing that the, underbarred, the underlying parts are the, the ones that we're building up to, that we'll achieve in the third part of the talk is how to achieve all of those simultaneously. But right now they're separated in two levels of abstraction. So with that, I will briefly take questions before going to the third part, to the second part.